Oh, hi, I'm Marcy Nelson, and I am an assistant professor in the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing, and I'm the director of Head and Neck Cancer Survivorship for UPMC Hillman. And I'm going to talk to you about life changes after diagnosis with head and neck cancer and therapy. And so I just want to start off by saying that head and neck cancer is a collective term that includes many sites within the head and neck. And so when I talk about what happens, I'm going to really talk about it in general terms. And it's because I know that there are a variety of patients and survivors listening to this call. And so we're just going to try to highlight some of the most common things that happen. And so the types of treatment really vary based on where your cancer is and how um, advanced the cancer is. But in general, patients can undergo a combination of treatments. So local treatment, which is surgery and radiation. Um, most patients nowadays go through intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT. Patients who've had recurrences may have stereotactic radiation or some patients may actually have experienced proton therapy. And then in combination to local therapy, we do offer systemic treatment. So these are chemotherapy such as cisplatin and the new innovation or novel therapy is immunotherapy like nivolumab or pembrolizumab. And so patients who are treated more recently or survivors treated more recently may have undergone this therapy. And because most of our cancer survivors present um, with more advanced stage, so that's just bigger tumors or more um, nodes positive, lymph nodes positive in the neck, they may undergo more than one of these treatments. So side effects occur because treatment affects healthy tissue and based on what you've had will be based on what you experience. So just providing some examples, if you've undergone surgery, there may be swelling at the surgery site, you may have pain, you may have stiffness, Patients who have radiation may experience pain, loss of taste, dry mouth, and chemotherapy can cause fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and loss of appetite. So immunotherapy is one of the novel therapies that we're seeing in clinical trials. And right now, immunotherapy seems to be better tolerated in many instances, but patients may experience things like rash or a change in their thyroid function. So I focus mostly on counseling patients about survivorship. Well, I do see patients pre-treatment. Most of the time is spent talking to patients after treatments end. So what about life after treatment ends? What do patients experience? What are the most common things that we've seen? And so the American Cancer Society put together an expert panel and they actually reviewed the literature that had been published on head and neck and they published guidelines in 2016. And this was meant for primary care doctors or family doctors to help better follow patients and survivors. But we do use this in our everyday practice to talk to, to, talk to survivors and to see what they're experiencing. And while when I first looked at this list, I thought it looked really comprehensive I can say now that there are things that we're continuing to learn about that aren't included on this list. But some of these may be things that you've experienced, such as dysphagia or trouble swallowing, trismus, which is the difficulty opening your mouth really wide, fatigue, um, xerostomia, which is dry mouth. And so the impact of treatment, we actually can divide what we call treatment effects or the impacts of treatment into two different categories long-term effects, and these are things that start during treatment and can persist after treatments end, ended. And these can include shoulder mobility. So if you had surgery, you may have difficulty with your shoulder mobility or movement right after um, surgery, and it may persist. Radiation can cause trouble swallowing that can continue to persist. And then chemotherapy, such as cisplatin, can cause changes in your hearing or ringing in your ears. So one of the other terms that we use are late effects. And so these are things that start after treatment has ended. And these can be difficult because they can occur five to six to seven years down the line. And many patients or survivors may not be um, following up with their oncology team as often, and they may not even realize that some of the things they're experiencing 
are related to their treatment. Examples are neuropathies, so neck spasms, um, even cognitive changes. And so this is just some information from our survivorship clinic and what our patients experience. And I can say that this is likely very similar to the general population of head and neck cancer patients with um, dysphagia or swallowing being the number one problem that our patients see. But one of the um, things that we've noted talking to our survivors is that many patients experience pain. So you can see that is the top third complaint of our patients. And that's really a general term because patients can have pain, survivors can have pain in many different places in their head and neck. You can have pain in your shoulder, in your neck, in your mouth. You can have pain in your teeth. You can have pain that's focused on when you swallow. And so that's really a complex issue to understand. Um, and we're moving to gain more information on that area and better help our patients and survivors deal with those chronic pain after treatment. And so I mentioned trouble swallowing or dysphagia. And so this is one of the most common um, problems that our patients report. And so problem swallowing commonly occur um, during treatment. They may get better after treatment. About 74% of our patients reported symptoms of difficulty swallowing. And what I'd like you to see in this chart is just the bottom purple line. So this is right after treatment ends. And actually, at this point, the lower down the line is means the patients have more symptoms. So after treatment, patients have a lot of trouble swallowing. And this does get better as time goes on. Patients um, report that they're having less trouble swallowing, they may have less pain, they may not have as much choking. Um, but if you look at the red line, um, that shows that at about six years, patients actually start to report more symptoms. And there are other studies that have shown something similar. And as you know, as you get further out of treatment, you do age. And so there may be a combination of what is attributed to your treatment, but also what is attributed to aging. And so it's important for survivors to know and to let their providers know when they start to have more trouble. And we know that many patients swallowing and survivor swallowing doesn't go back to normal. And so the question is really, has anything changed from the last time we talked to you? I know you've done these things for a long period of time to help you swallow better. Have you had to do new things? Or there, do things stick more frequently? And so that's a better gauge of, of letting us know if we need to try to help and intervene. And so it's really important to just, um, if you're not following up with your treatment team regularly because you're years out down the line to really know who to contact if you begin to have more concerns about your swallowing. So musculoskeletal impairments, it's a term that really can incorporate a lot of different things. So after treatment, you may have changes in your muscles, um, in the neck, in the shoulder, in the jaw, in the tongue. These impairments and trouble can cause pain. They can cause difficulty with mobility. So can you turn your head fully from one side to the other? Um, stiffness, maybe you can't look up or look down, or you get cramping or spasms in your neck. And survivors may also experience um, trouble with lymphedema, which is a talk later on in the series, um, gait, posture, um, changes with fatigue. So having um, trouble kind of being able to do all your activities that you normally do because you get tired um, more easily. And so one of the areas that we focused on in terms of musculoskeletal changes is pain and neck disability. So I mentioned that pain is one of our top three complaints by our survivors. And neck disability is really pain that stops you from doing certain daily activities. So an example would be pain that interferes with driving, pain that interferes with working. And this picture is just a manifestation or a picture of a, a display of what can happen to patients if they have some contractures, they may get forward head posture. And if you look at this figure, you can see that there are three different categories. There's surgery alone, so patients only get surgery. 
um, non-surgical, so this would be radiation, and patients in this group did not have surgery. And then there's a surgery and adjuvant treatment, so that just means that patients had surgery and they had radiation or chemo after. And the important thing to see here is that patients who never underwent surgery can have neck disability. So this is sometimes surprising to survivors because surgery is something that they view as very invasive. And while radiation can be very painful, the changes in your skin go away after treatment ends and patients may not connect some of this pain or this stiffening or spasming to their treatment. I've had patients come in and survivors come in that say, you know, I must have, I just can't get a pillow. That it just, I tried 10 pillows, I wake up with neck pain every morning. And so this neck pain may not be related to sleeping wrong, it's more likely related to your treatment. And then we actually didn't see, so about 50% probability of experiencing neck disability for patients who had chemo and radiation. And we didn't really see a significant increase when patients underwent surgery and adjuvant treatment. So these are the two groups at most at greatest risk for this. So it's important to just monitor those symptoms and know that this um, neck pain may be related to the treatment you had. And so one of the things that I didn't show you in the first chart, but when you looked at the bar graph, it showed swallowing, dry mouth, and pain. An important thing about those treatment-related effects is that they don't always happen in isolation. Patients don't always just have swallowing and they don't always just have pain. Many times these things can happen together and they can really kind of um, impact other treatment effects or other functional ability. So when we look at patients who have trouble swallowing and we look at patients who have neck disability, Patients who don't have any pain in their neck or limited motion in their neck seem to have less trouble swallowing. But the more trouble that patients have in terms of neck disability, they will tend to report more trouble swallowing. And so for us as providers, it's important for us to not just look at one aspect like neck pain, but also see how that impacts other activities that you do like swallowing and figure out better ways to address both of those issues to hopefully provide our survivors with optimal outcomes. So dental health. So dental health is very much the same. Dental health can impact other things. It can impact swallowing. So survivors may have sensory changes. They may have pain, changes in taste. They may have um, more sensitivity to certain things like spicy foods or acidic foods. They may have dry mouth or xerostomia. Dental disease and periodontal changes, so cavities and caries being one of those, when looking at head and neck cancer survivors and looking at patients who haven't had head and neck cancer, patients have more caries and other issues than patients who don't have head and neck cancer. And so some of the other things that don't happen very commonly are osteoradium necrosis, so change in your jaw, um, which can cause some bone to come through your um, skin and the inside of your mouth, or even um, in the worst case, your jaw may break. And so we do everything to kind of monitor that. And then um, changes in your jaw joint. So maybe when you open really wide now, you may feel a popping. It may be difficult to open wide. And so preventative care is something that we talk about a lot with our survivors. And this can include um, good brushing, good flossing, good rinsing, um, also using a high fluoride toothpaste. So fluoride trays and fluoride toothpaste are one of the things that we actually have used as an initiative in our clinic, and we do provide high fluoride toothpaste to survivors at no cost because we know that it's something that's important, but it can be fairly costly, surprisingly, and it is something that's important to help strengthen the enamel on your teeth when after radiation, your mouth is dry. This makes many patients and survivors' mouth more acidic. And so sometimes when we talk to patients, um, I've actually tested pH on hundreds of our patients, and a lot of pH is the acidity of your mouth. And so in testing these patients, one of the things we saw were that most patients' mouths, survivors' mouths, are more 
acidic. And so that means your mouth is more like Pepsi than water. And so that can really affect your enamel. And so high fluoride toothpaste really helps try to prevent some of that breakdown of the enamel. And then good follow-up care with your dentist. We do recommend every three to four months, um, six months at the minimum, if, depending on what your insurance will allow for. And then psychological effects. So these can be body and self-image. So body image concerns are a diminished self-perception. Changes in behavior impact of relationships. The patients who have um, a different self-perception may avoid social activities. And distress, depression, and anxiety. And so the prevalence is, or the amount of survivors who experience these um, psychosocial effects vary widely, and it's mostly because nobody really measures them the exact same way. So we do screening tools, we do give other tools, patients can see psychiatrists and psychologists, and they may measure this differently, but we know that it is a significant problem. And if you look at the broader term of distress, this really includes a lot of these things like worry, anxiety, sadness, emotional concerns, social disruption, as I mentioned above, even fear of recurrence. This is very um, real for survivors. Um, and it's something that they do worry about for years down the line, and even post-traumatic stress disorder. And so as providers, it's important that we routinely screen our survivors and that we feel comfortable talking about these things, but you should also feel comfortable talking to your provider about these and having them um, help identify resources for you to use. So these could be counseling, this could be um, psychologists, psychiatrists, support groups. Um, there are support groups for head and neck. There are support groups for patients who have a change in their body image. And so there are a lot of different ways for us to help um, you find resources to address these issues. And so I didn't start off with this, but I wanted to bring up the term or the definition of survivorship. So survivorship focuses on health well-being of a person with cancer from the time of diagnosis until the end of life. And we've talked about very quickly um, or several of these different areas. So we've talked about the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the social impact that head and neck cancer has. But this last one, um, financial toxicity or financial effects, is something we're learning more and more about. We've known from talking with survivors that it happens but now there's more data to give us a better idea of how many survivors experience um, financial effects. And it may be one of the hardest things as providers for us to help you with because um, beyond connecting with you, connecting you with a social worker, um, there's not a lot of resources in many cancer institutes to start addressing this, but there's um, continuing work going on in this area. So financial toxicity, is the term that's used now, but this is just a term for something that's been going on for years. So financial burden, financial hardship. So it's the impact of healthcare costs that lead to a significant, significant financial burden for patients and their caregivers. This can contribute to increased psychological or psychosocial distress, diminished outcomes for, your, for our patients and our survivors. And um, some studies have shown that when patients or survivors experience financial burden, they may have more um, poor quality of life. So the estimation again varies, and this is because everybody looks at this a little bit differently, but 15 to 40% of survivors report financial toxicity. This is difficulty paying for housing, food, or medication, and relying on savings and loans. And so if this is a concern, it's really important to bring this up to your um, healthcare providers if they don't talk to you about it. And we do know, and while the first assumption is that patients only experience financial toxicity during treatment, we know that survivors also experience more out-of-pocket costs. And this can be related to many of the things we've already talked about. Um, physical therapy or neck disability, swallowing therapy for dysphagia, so these all contribute to out-of-pocket costs, 
that can accumulate and affect survivor's ability to pay for other things. And so this is just a brief summary of some of the most common things that we see. And survivors, we know, have complex physical and psychosocial needs stemming from their treatment, and that these treatment issues can really persist. And we're learning more about how long-term survivors experience treatment-related effects and how we can better address them, both right after treatment and later down the lines. And that a comprehensive approach to head and neck cancer survivorship care are really needed so that we can better address these issues because they don't occur in isolation. One does not necessarily mean you don't have dry mouth and pain and swallowing and all together. And so how can we better address these issues? And so now I'd like to introduce one of our head and neck cancer survivors, uh, Lynn Garbarino. And we're gonna just talk a little bit about her experience undergoing cancer treatment and some of the effects she, she's experienced after her treatment has ended. Hi Lynn, can you just first tell the audience about your cancer diagnosis and what treatment you had? Sure, um, I was diagnosed with cancer of the jaw um, in March of 19, I had surgery. Um, to replace a mandibuloctomy and also um, bilateral nose section um, after it was discovered I had cancer in the jaw. I've had um, surgery for many years and because I never had baby teeth that developed. So as I, over the last 35 years, I've had implants and bridges and one of, there was some cancer near a couple of those implants. That's when it was discovered that I had some pain and it's opened a whole world that I would have never realized what was happening. I had um, surgery, 11 hour surgery, and then 30 radiation treatments. I'm very lucky, I, my lymph nodes were negative, so I did not have to have chemotherapy. So what were some of the side effects that you experienced while you were undergoing radiation? Oh, radiation was awful. <laughs> I think that was the worst thing. I made it through surgery, um, was recovering, and then um, a few weeks after radiation started, I realized I couldn't taste sugar or salt at all. Um, nausea, pain, tightness, swelling, scar tissue, you name it, you hit it on the nose with your presentation because I had a little bit of everything. Fatigue, I just uh, would sleep all day at times. Were these things that you were prepared? Did you expect, did your treatment team um, educate you on those? UPMC was great. They prepared me three weeks before surgery. They had me exercise, gave me immuno drinks, told me to eat 3,000 to 5,000 calories a day. Can you believe it? Um, and increase my protein. They talked to my family. My family sat down with me and told me what they wanted from me. I had nurtured them all of my life. Suddenly, they were nurturing me and taking care of me. So UPMC did a great job. They all sat down, told me, my family, what we needed to do. You're still surprised though. You're like a deer in headlights that you have no idea all of the symptoms that are going to be accumulating. Sometimes that's probably best. I had no idea that I would have the dry mouth, that I would have lip weakness, that I would be one of those diagnosed with lymphedema. So it's still a reality. So when you were done treatment, um, what were some of the treatment effects that persisted? And are you still experiencing some of those today? I am. I have a lymphedema that I put um, on a lymphedema pump every day and I do manual lymphatic massage and exercise. I have scar tissue that I really have to tackle. I have um, difficulty opening my mouth fully. Um, my tongue uh, was not numb after the first surgery. So I didn't feel that 
that wasn't a problem. But swallowing is always an issue, whether it's chewing or swallowing a solid bolus. It's not always easy. What were some of the things that you did after treatment to try to address those effects that persisted? I know you my, mentioned lymphedema. Anything uh, else? My, I stayed with my daughter, and she had... Um, friends take me to every appointment or she would take me to every appointment. My son took me. The support was amazing. She brought in a massage therapist to her house twice a week to help me massage. She's also lymphedema certified. Um, I did the best I could in exercise. I um, went to PT, speech therapy, um, all of those above that have mentioned. I uh, self-treated, but I also sought as much uh, guidance as I could. So I know you that you had a recurrence just in this year and had another surgery. Has anything changed? Have you had more um, effects since then um, after your second surgery? I totally lost the feeling and sensation in my tongue. I have regained half of it. So I'm still struggling with sensation. Neck sensation uh, was always a problem and jaw. That's starting to recover a little bit, but tongue really threw me for a loop. Taste um, was different. So after radiation, I lost my taste of sugar and salt. I did go to a gentleman, sort of like a hypnotist, the next day I could taste sugar, the sugar cookie for the first time. It dissipates, so you, chew, you swallow a little bit and you taste the sugar and then it goes away. But after this one, I can taste sugar for a while. Salt tastes better. Foods though, um, you might want crave something and you eat a few bites and then you could care less about the remaining portion of your food. So it, it's been uh, stamina. Fatigue has been one of those things that has been more difficult. Because you have gone back to work, correct? I did. I was on short-term disability um, for both surgeries, and I did go back to work. That pushed me to, to have to achieve more and probably was the best mentally for me um, and to be back around my friends at home. So if you, I'm going to ask you for two pieces of advice. I'd like you to give a piece of advice to me as a provider, because I think it's important for us to hear from our survivors and to really kind of incorporate into our practice, and then a piece of advice for the survivors listening. Oh, my goodness. We want to be we want normal. We want to forget things and move forward. And we have to realize that this is our new normal, that every day we're getting changes and we just have to somehow laugh when we realize we have food on our chin and didn't realize it. I'm still working on that aspect. Um, I don't think we can prepare for all of the symptoms that are happening but as far as support, I was my family and my um, wonderful friends that got me through it. I was on autopilot and I have, um, have been blessed with my faith and my family to help me through this. Listen to the therapist and do the best you can because they're out there to help us. Um, and um, it, it just takes time to recover. We wanted to do it. We want to recover now. It will just take time. How about a piece of advice for me as a healthcare provider? Oh my goodness. Um, get us to get to Cancer Survivors Clinic. That was the best thing that happened to me because even though it was very long, and, and, but they, they provided me the dentist that wonderful. They listened to me. They helped me to get and authorize a lymphedema pump, which is the best thing I did for myself. So they got me therapy. They gave me some standards to work with. The speech therapist gave me standards. So as I know that 
we're so tired of going to more appointments and um, every time you turn around, you have to go to another doctor, to another therapist. But Cancer Survivors Clinic, if you can just get to, is, is really was an important factor in, in my transition. Is that a good advice? That's a great advice, mostly because I lead the clinic, but <laughs> I didn't pay her. So thank you. No, I do think having, um, for us, having providers and realizing that there's multiple things that you experience and for us to really help connect our survivors with people that we know can help them is something that's very important to us. Um, and I know it's important to our survivors. So I just wanna thank you very much for sharing your experience with um, the audience. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Marcy.